When you find something doesn't work, give it up. Don't be like the traditional Englishman in France who, because the Frenchman doesn't understand his English, starts to shout louder. Open yourself to different strategies and different possibilities. What I want you to be aware of is that in Ericksonian hypnosis what you're doing is bypassing conscious processes. When a person comes for hypnotherapy, it's generally quite rigid, not flexible. Rigid consci uh, consciously for his problem, I really mean. Now you don't want to work on his conscious mind, He's been trying to get over his problem that way, and it hasn't worked, that's why he's sitting opposite you. So you don't want to work on his conscious mind, you want to work without the conscious mind being involved. And for that, if you pace and lead, you can lead him into utilizing the unconscious mind. I suppose really there are three principles of induction. One, secure and absorb the attention to pace unconscious processes and three utilize the unconscious processes one of the things I want to explore at the moment is using by using the Ericksonian approach is dissociation Now the interesting thing is that the unconscious can respond independently from the conscious mind and the person doesn't even have to be in trance. It happens all the time, that you well know. The foot pressing down on an imaginary brake when you think the driver should stop, etc. Now, to get the conscious mind occupied so that the unconscious mind can respond independently. In the hypnosis inductions, one method often used is to ask the client to count backwards from, say, 300. That's an exercise which can keep the conscious mind occupied. You can make it even more of a distraction if he mentally counts down from 300 while visualizing the numbers 1, 2, 3 up to 300. Or, by reciting the alphabet backwards slowly, and yet having a picture of the alphabet going from A, B, so on to Z, so that when he visualizes, visualizes A, he is saying Z, B, Y, C, X, and so on. Now, this dissociation, this uh, 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 conscious mind being occupied while the unconscious becomes uh, a little more able to respond independently, it can be achieved by metaphor. Metaphor stories that really are not the same as a person's problem, but the structure is in some way one element in the story, one element in the problem. Now metaphor can be aimed at the conscious mind so that he says, ah yes, I understand, that's on a conscious level, but actually far better to aim it so that the conscious mind really doesn't understand. Now the whole point of metaphor is to be able to bypass the conscious mind, conscious awareness. You can slant what you said that it gives the person a different understanding of his problem, but metaphor, metaphor for the unconscious for the unconscious mind is what I want to concentrate on, not for the conscious mind.
You can use metaphor to access certain experiences in a person and you can access a sequence of experiences. Now, you should really have no difficulty in talking. Don't run out of things to say. Practice talking. Hesitations now and then, just as you hear from me on this tape and in class. What you should be able to do after pacing, using an induction and pacing, after several minutes, tell stories, metaphor. What the hypnotists generally do is tell a story. Floating down a river, on a beach, or somewhere in the country, or whatever. Now there can be a danger in this type of story, the standard type, in that one, the person may already know them, or know the story, and already have very rigid responses to it. And the other danger in this type of story, the standard type, is that the standard types are not as indi not individualized and therefore they're not as flexible as they should be. What you can do, of course, is to take a standard story in combination with some of your own and switch things around a bit. Erickson, of course, had a vast number of stories he could tell, been in practice for so long. But even you are able to tell stories from your own experience. I mean, you've had a few experiences in your life, haven't you? Stories from your own life that could be made applicable to the person's problem. Purpose of the stories, story particularly in the first session, is one to continually absorb the person's consciousness and build a rapport. And second purpose is so that you can begin to access processes that can support the person in a general way. Now people are continually striving to make another person's communication relevant to themselves. Bandler and Grinder says that a trans-derivational search is carried out to make the communication meaningful to them. could be called personal reference. How many of you watched a film? Well, a film, you know, where the hero or heroine has had a grueling time and you've finished up exhausted. Or watched someone almost dying of thirst in the desert and as soon as possible you had to rush for a drink or an ice cream. Remember this, your sensory systems are hooked up to your motor physical systems and you cannot use one without the involvement of the other. So now what you do as a hypnotist is trade on the selfishness of people. As you tell a story, inside comes the question, how does this relate to me? Since we are so selfish, immediately a story is heard associative material experiences from the person's own life are activated and of course such is this intimate link between sensory and motor that when there are sensory responses there are physical responses that you're able to see when the person is able to relate things to himself then he's able to learn a lot better than if he wasn't able to find a relationship. Remember this when you have a person come to you with learning disability. What you have to do is amplify a person's response to a sports story. Obviously you don't have the response to a story in a different context. For example, if you're very busy and someone tells a story that has nothing to do with the business in hand, it has not the same impact, meaning, as if that story had been told in a more suitable setting or at a more suitable time. If you tell a story about your holiday at a very busy business meeting, the others will get irritable and start saying, why don't you get to the point? Associative responses are not produced. But tell the story over a re very relaxed meal when business doesn't intrude and there's a totally different response. A 
so what was all this leading to? It was an exercise, remember? I want you to write down what the hypnotic trance means to you. If you're going into trance, what kind of experience are you having? What is the trance like for you? Or if you haven't had trance, or so you may think, what do you experience when you become absorbed internally? So absorbed that you switch off externally. Floating, letting go, deep relaxation, heaviness. Use verbs to describe what the trance state is. On going into trance I experience. Take all the time in the world during the next couple of minutes and write down, say, two things, two verbs. Get together with a partner and exchange papers. When you have your partner's paper, then for each word that he's written down, take from your own personal life experience three experiences. Three experiences that are relevant to each of those words. And do this with your client. Ask your client, what does trance state mean to you? What happens? And then make a metaphor. To be more explicit, if someone had said, it letting go, then I'll make a note of maybe two or three experiences that happened in my life where I let go. Not only about the feeling of experience, feeling of the experience, but also exactly what actually what happened, the people involved, the situation, even to the extent of what was going on in my mind at the time. Now these experiences can be recent or in the far past. Someone said it means relaxation, and what I could do, what you could do, is talk of going on holiday, being on holiday, right from the moment of packing the bags, looking forward, the journey, the arrival, setting in, a real life story of enjoying a relaxed holiday, and make the details good. If you drove down to wherever you went on holiday, mention even little things like stopping to stretch your legs because you were stiff from driving. We stopped at the edge of a wood to have a picnic because it looked so lovely and peaceful. wonderful thing about metaphor is that after like this is that after a while these stories almost create themselves they flow easily effortlessly especially when you yourself move into a pleasant relaxed state of altered awareness now in telling the story don't be too succinct elaborate elaborate take 15 minutes maybe and going into detail Initially, you'll miss a lot of what the listener is showing as he shares your experience. But eventually stories that you tell will take into account the person's ongoing experience. Now, I'm talking to someone who's sitting opposite with me with her eyes open, as an example. I'm talking about driving down to Devon on holiday. I talked and I talked. I could say I got very tired because I'd had no sleep the previous night. And so I'd gone about a hundred miles. I was quite, quite tired of driving. So I changed places with my wife and she drove so that I could shut eyes for a while. Mark that with a voice change. Don't forget you'll start so many stories with a person looking at you. So, what did I do? Early in the story I used an embedded command as a probe <coughs> to find out whether or not I was sufficiently in rapport to start a leading. If the eyes had closed then I would have known rapport existed and I had moved then into a leading state. If the eyes hadn't closed, then I'd lost nothing because I'd not asked him to do anything. And I drifted off into a lovely relaxed state where 
you are able to dream and enjoy the dream and just let go elaborate and while you're elaborating remember you can get unexpected results sometimes you can tell a story and get unpleasant response simply because of an unpleasant association with a time or an experience in the person's life for example you may start talking or telling a story about a time when you were in the desert and that person may have an unpleasant reaction or you can tell a story about a time that you were on the river and the person can have an unpleasant reaction or it can be an unpleasant reaction for lots and lots of them. may use a word that is a little bit well not quite so easy to really think of an experience how would you what story could you tell about detachment separation you know someone if you, you asked a person what is trance like to you it's the feeling of being detached or separated now the idea is that you don't have to think of an experience that absolutely fits but let's think what can you separate husband from wife trailer from a car cream from milk separating your clothes from your body when you get undressed never forget the stories can have many meanings and don't always think of the psychological angle of that rely on your unconscious mind to select a nice story let your mind go don't constrict yourself by thinking only in the hypnotic contents, context think of the general process let me give you a mini metaphor about detachment or separation a baby, have you ever seen a baby feeding at a mother's breast suckling enjoying Sometimes the eyes close, and sometimes they're wide open, looking up at the mother, sometimes stopping suckling just for a moment, because maybe the mother smiled down at the baby, and gradually a slowing down of the sucking movement, and the eyes close. Then a sudden starting of the sucking movement again, and then stopping, and the head moves back, just a little bit, and contest, con Tact is lost without being noticed. Because the baby had felt comfortable and got to sleep. So, practice metaphor, practice, practice, practice metaphor is most vitally important. I've mentioned a lot of times that in trance you don't have to listen to me. The focus should be on your internal experience and I as a hypnotist should only be a guide and that is one of the interesting aspects of trance. The person will still be in complete rapport with the hypnotist but will be paying more attention to the internal experience and the hypnotist should not resist anything that is shown, should not miss anything that is shown. Let's take a couple of things that happen in trance quite frequently. A person starts to slip over to one side or the head tips over to one side. Now he may become aware of it or he may not, but you can incorporate what has happened. 
tell him he can make any adjustment necessary to ensure that he is comfortable. At night we sleep, when we do not sleep in just one position, we automatically, unconsciously, make ourselves more comfortable. Make yourself more comfortable. Otherwise you can finish up the session with a sore buttock or a sore neck. Now some people may become a little bit dizzy or disorientated or a little bit feeling a little sick, a bit nauseous. If that happens in the future then pay attention to the person's breathing. Ask the person to pay attention to his breathing because there may be a been terrific cessation of breathing, slowing down of breathing. So take a deep breath. Breathing centers a person. When you have a person in trance in front of you, watch the breathing. If it stops then and you can be aware of your breathing and as you breathe deeply in and out you can go deeply into a state of trance you can let yourself go deeply deeply into yourself now I've mentioned before in a different way what associations does a person have with a trance state can be both feet on the floor and your hands resting on your thighs or it can be an altered voice may have noticed I alter my voice when doing an induction, etc. When you've worked with a person a couple of times and your altered voice or special look or way of settling back or a gesture helps put him into an altered state. It becomes a very powerful anchor. Very powerful associations are built up that way. To get an age regression, talk about things connected with childhood, the alphabet, nursery rhyme, school, a knick-knack. But remember, it does depend on the person's mental state at that moment. If he's in a totally rational, business-like state, then it will be brushed aside quickly. So you have to help him to get to the state you know is conducive to entering an altered state. And here, non-verbal communication is most important. Once the processes occur, and then accessing occurs. There was a way that Erickson obtained change. He would say things that another hypnotist could say and he'd get change, whereas the other hypnotist didn't. The difference was that he set the stage very carefully by working with non-verbal communication. If you utilize all different responses, resistances, possible disturbances, and you make it easy then for the person to respond to a suggestion about change, Utilize the natural associations that are in the person to achieve what is wanted. In class, some people say, Ray, I really want to listen to you, but every time I start to listen, I go into a sort of trance state. What shall I do? I'd suggest then, just do what you find is easy to do. Go into a trance state. You'll learn so much more that way. Don't try to go into trance. But if you find yourself going into trance, let it happen. Don't fight it. You'll pick up lots of information in the unconscious state that you'll find yourself using in the future. So you've got to set the stage, and we've been talking about metaphor, and you're starting with metaphor. Now how can you start the story so that the person is really listening, participating? If you say, OK, I want to tell you a story, he'll promptly think, Tell me a story. What on earth for? What do you want him to tell me a story for? Invite him to participate. Make him feel involved. Ask him to participate, but indirectly. Has he been skiing? Fine. Now, ask the question, have you been skiing? You've got his interest if he has, and you've got his interest because of associative memories, and you could then start to talk. Listening to you a moment ago reminded me of something that happened to me when I went skiing for the first time. Hmm? If you were trying to communicate with someone who had been to India, and you had been to India, or read a lot about India, then I know you've been to India, and I wonder what, if you found what I found. Ask him some initial questions first. What you do is to move the person towards where you want him to go. And if you get an unpleasant reaction as you're telling the story, you might want to abandon the story, but it'd be far better really to incorporate what you see into the story. And that's interesting, isn't it? 
And you might like to examine that for a moment because there may be something new in that experience for you to discover. In other words, you stop the indirect and you move more into the direct. Without mentioning anything specific, Anyhow, you don't really know what he's experiencing, so you can't really be very direct, can you? So you start a story, and you get a response. Go with the response. Or you can modify the story, backtrack a little, go down another path. You've been talking along the lines of, and so, as we came to the rocks on the beach, and suddenly there's an unpleasant response. And I thought for a moment, it stopped, I stopped for a moment, and I turned to go back because I thought, etc, etc, etc. But what you do as a therapist, you make a note of what happened when you said that. Now Erickson, Erickson told a series of different stories and watched carefully to see what unpleasant emotional responses the person would have. He knew then what could be an important thing to concentrate on. It started out very general, various general experiences, and it watched the person to find out what the person reacted to. If you're working with someone and get a response, then give him other ways of responding. Include other possibilities. And I, I, I wasn't sure. I, I wasn't sure whether that, that was an uncomfortable or a comfortable feeling. It was very odd, really. I wasn't sure whether to feel bad or feel good. Then you've covered both possibilities, and very comfortably and safe, safely, and then you can move on. Now remember this, that other people, the people coming to you have undoubtedly tried other therapists. Other therapists who had a succession of failures, usually. That's why they're sitting opposite you. Trade on that. Tell stories of a series of metaphor, all aimed at failure. Everything is about failure person listening is waiting for the happy ending. We all do that. We expect that the hero will finally surmount his difficulties and succeed. And you start another metaphor, and the person is listening with bated breath. Will he succeed this time? And you smile smugly to yourself and say, not on your life, it's another failure. Can you remember what it was like when you were very small and had stories read to you? And time after time the hero or the heroine experienced failure and your heart sank inside you. But all the time you knew deep down inside it would be all right in the end. Remember that? So you tell of unsuccessful attempts and you're building up quite an emotional response. You're intensifying whatever pain or problem that the person has and you can non-verbally communicate that everything is quite safe, secure, that this is a safe place to experience, explore. Introduce new elements into the situation that can allow that to happen. One of the things that you should be able to do is be in the story. Feel as though you are participating in it. It will make it all sound more convincing. And remember to watch very carefully. Very carefully indeed. But as another sort of angle on this failure after failure, can you remember in what happens in a circus? Someone's going to do a trick that has never been done before. There's a roll of drums and they've asked for silence, dead silence. And what happens? He attempts the trick and fails. There's a ah from all over the audience, all from from the audience. So he's going to try it again. Roll of drums, even more silence. And he succeeds. The applause then is infinitely greater than if it's done it in the first place. Remember to watch very carefully and learn to recognize a response that shows too much conscious mind involvement. You want to overwhelm the conscious mind so that the person falls back on unconscious mind resources. So if it's obvious that he's still too consciously involved, speed up a little bit. Don't go too slow. 
introduce lots of new elements to overload the conscious mind. If you get the person shaking his head, then include something wrong in the story, something that went wrong, a wrong turning. Something wasn't right and I thought about it, but I went on because I knew it would be all right and comfortable. Include everything that you get from the person. Actually, what you have to do is try to be a better hypnotist than the client sitting opposite you. Did you know that most clients run better hip uh, inductions than a hypnotist? If you don't believe me, sit in with some hypnotherapy session. You'll hear the client talking and the therapist sitting with glazed eyes, accessing lots of associative stuff. However, the client talks and from what he says you can pick up useful information that can form the basis of metaphor. I have these dreadful panic attacks. They come on right out of the blue. I can't think, I can't move, and it's just terrible. The experiences, the inability to move, to do. Good thing to introduce, and easy to introduce, is catalepsy to show him a hypnotic phenomena. Do you know of any other experiences you have of being unable to move, unable to do anything? Let me say it. In this way you can make a transition, changing from one thing a person gets fixated on to other things, other stories. Take one aspect of a client's story, a client's problem, and use a crossover technique to move over to something else to disrupt the fixation. Another way is to emphasize relief of a problem. One thing that Erickson did a lot, he'd make a precise statement of the problem, then make it into a general statement, it say, and you'll be able to get relief in many different ways. I'll give you an example. I had a patient once. Then he'd overlap from the problem to the story by going from specific to general and then back to specific. You want relief? You can get relief in lots of ways. I'll give you an example. Now, you don't have to be bull at the gate about this. If you do it too quickly, the client isn't with you. So, one thing you can do is to link yourself into the client's tr trance. And by asking questions, apparently innocent questions, that's one way to begin to link into his reality. And while you ask questions, you use a lot of non-verbal communication. You use body mirroring, eye contact, matching breathing matching predicate and you find you can't move, you can't do anything but you haven't yet told me what it is that you would like to be able to do I have some idea perhaps you'd eventually be happy to have things all right to have things okay and you can practice that because you have had a bad experience in the past and may be uncertain Yet I can't do anything with you until I'm totally connected with you. Pace, 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 and start to lead, lead, 